Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Zeev Haskell. I'm a professor of radiology at the University of Virginia, emeritus editor of the Journal of Vascular and Interventional Radiology, and I'm the director of the UVA keynote lecture series, its moderator, and your host tonight. We have a special and extraordinary event, a national panel of renowned experts to address a particular topic that I think is a gap and a need of dialogue in healthcare. We're all obviously aware of the extraordinary year of racial and ethnic violence and slurs and this ongoing national dialogue. Obviously, these issues have been going on for decades and they're religious, ethnic, racial, gender, ability and disability issues well beyond this as well. But tonight we're focused on something very specific, which is when you're the healthcare provider, such as from nursing student and med student to tenured professor, mentor, educator, or otherwise, and you're the target, or equally, the witness. How do we prepare for that? And this evening came about from talking to my uh, good friend and longstanding colleague, Dr. Mister, who's kind enough to join us as a panelist and to share the opening case study, who described something very recently that was rather shocking. And I contacted a lot of my colleagues around North America who said, we really had no preparation for this. If I face this either as a witness or um, as the target, what do I do? Has anybody talked to me? And it was clear that there's sort of a gap here and we'd like to take this hour as an opportunity to really touch on that, certainly as a starting point. How do you respond? What do you do? How do you manage this? So the loose structure of the evening is around a series of case scenarios if we get to them. Um, there'll be plenty of time for panelists to talk and then a summary round at the end for points that they want to emphasize. And naturally this is being recorded and we will have posting of a great set of resources and a particular program at UVA that's available on, on how to um, approach this that'll be on our website with that that you can turn to. Now, I'm going to quickly introduce um, the panelists uh, so as not to take up too much time. Um, Dr. Tracy Downs, who is professor at the Department of uh, Urology at uh, Wisconsin Madison School of Medicine, but actually the incoming UVA inaugural Chief of Diversity and Community Engagement. Dr. Kim Penberthy, who's the Chester Carlson Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences, and also co-director of both the Physician Clinical Evaluation Program and the Effective Coping and Communication Skills for Physicians at UVA. We have Dr. Raymond Liu, who's an Exec Director at uh, Mass General for the Brigham Global Advisory and Associate Chair of uh, Business Strategy and Analytics at MGH. Dr. Margaret Plus ogan Peggy, the Brody Professor of Medicine, the Co-Director of the Wisdom and Wellbeing Program at UVA. Dr. Arturo Saavedra, welcome back, Art. Uh, Chair and Professor of the UVA Department of Dermatology and also Chief of Population Health and Health Policy at UVA. And Dr. Sanjay Misra, who's a professor world-renowned NIH-funded researcher in interventional radiology and um, radiology and imaging and basic science as well. And just a few weeks ago, Sanjay shared a story with me, and that was really the basis of why I pulled this evening together. So with that, if you'd be so kind as to tell us that. Thank you. Thank you, Z, for the kind comments and remarks and pulling this together, friends and colleagues. Uh, about six weeks ago, um, I was starting a case with a Asian fellow, and we were walking down the hall uh, with masks and uh, blues on and hats, and a patient went by on a gurney, and she said to the person pushing them, run them both over. And about 50 feet down the hall, I turned to him and I said, uh, I think this is microaggression. And he said, no, this is macroaggression. And at that point, I was trying to obviously uh, had nothing to offer as to how to role model the situation. This was the first time this happened. So I was trying to use levity. I shared these comments with Ziv and here we are now to talk about this. So Tracy, if I can ask you to either give a larger perspective or otherwise on, on how we think about something like this. Yeah, de definitely. And thanks um, for having me a part of this great panel and a uh, very important conversation. So I, I think 
uh, one of the acknowledgements of most microaggressions are that they usually catch us off guard. Um, and you are immediately, you're almost, you know, it's almost like, uh, <laughs> like being on a, a, um, a long distance, old fashioned long distance call, maybe a Zoom meeting, and you feel like there's a time delay and it may be 15, 20 seconds lag and you go, wait a minute, did I just hear what I, and there's almost like an awareness or an acknowledgement that did someone really say that, you know, I want to run them, you should run them both over. And, um, and, and so I want to give a little bit of just history microaggressions to kind of set the stage. So it actually was coined by a psychiatrist at Harvard, um, Dr. Chester uh, Middlebrook. Uh, and he, the term was initially used to convey the everyday verbal and nonverbal sight snubs or insults that communicate hostile derogatory or negative messages that degrade black Americans. So initially was these comments targeted towards black or African Americans. Now we know that that was a very narrow definition. And I'll end with there are really three types of uh, microaggressions. And I think as we're going through tonight, we can figure out uh, which type of this one uh, occurred. There are micro insults. There are micro invalidations uh, and the typical micro invalidation would be I'm colorblind or I don't see color um, and uh, to trivialize. And then the third one is a micro assault. And so those are kind of the technical um, domains of microaggressions. So. Ray, have you experienced something like this, or what? What would your response have been in that setting? Have you prepped your mind? You've written eloquently on this in the JVR last year. Yeah, I mean that setting, I think in particular, would have um, thrown all of us off guard. I mean, I think that my response to this uh, and the purpose of us being together here um, is a sense of scripting, quite frankly. Right? There's sort of an ability of spending time with each other and being able to be ready and at the ready. I think a couple of takeaways, at least for me, Sandra and, and Zeev and others, right, is, is there's the element of, as Zeev has mentioned before, the dynamic of a trainee um, as well as a, a senior um, uh, attending. Um, and the question is sort of who should speak up. I, I think what I want to get away, <laughs> take away of, the, of this is it's often difficult for the person or the target to speak up, right? And so the onus really should be on um, the, uh, the, the person in power, right? And so, um, you know, Dr. Yeah. Mistra was caught off guard, but I think in the future we all understand that um, those who have the power should have the responsibility to, to speak up. And Ray and Steve, I think the other thing that we are not getting is training in this, right? The whole world has changed in the last 24 months. And I'm now 25 years into my medical career. This is the first time it happens. And the training I'm getting is going home and talking to my wife who's counseling me. Um, and so I think one thing that really needs to happen is how do we get ourselves trained to handle this as role models, mentors, or even students? So Kim, maybe I can ask you as 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 a psychiatrist, um, the injury that you suffer. You know that if if Sanjay has six minutes to drive home, and you know I, I as a middle aged white man. I, I, but I've actually experienced casual anti-Semitism for decades, and I just sort of let it go in healthcare settings or in towns or otherwise. But you have eight minutes to drive home with this, and now you're at home. I mean, how does this affect us? What do we do with this? What does it do with our families? And what kind of outlets do we need to think about or, or, or use? Well, it, it absolutely impacts us. I mean, as, as you see, um, you know, Sanjay carried this with him. And so uh, we um, have have to find ways to process this in the moment and um, often sharing with uh, uh, our spouses, our loved ones at home can be an option if we have that. And I think the bigger point here is really being prepared to handle this moment so that we don't have to carry that home. And there are strategies that um, myself as a psychologist, um, you know, have learned 
and uh, can apply. And yet in, in the medical field, they're typically not taught uh, across the board. And so that's why developing programming where people can be trained um, how to respond uh, for themselves, how to take action on behalf of the other person. Um, in this case, it would be important also to think about training for, for all the healthcare workers. So there was someone pushing uh, that patient who, uh, you know, who was impacted as well. We haven't mentioned that person, um, how, how, they, how they carried that with them. Um, obviously there were learners, there were um, po potentially other people around. So providing treatment, uh, training for, for everyone sort of in ways to process this uh, in the moment. And then also um, uh, when they're um, on their own later. So I know we're going to turn to some of those specific examples, but before we do, um, uh, uh, Arturo, I wanted to sort of ask you, you know, what's the hospital responsibility or anyone on the panel? Because, you know, have, like, like Sandhya, we've experienced these types of things for decades and never thought about it, then maybe we just bring it home to our family or we're just keep it inside of ourselves. But there's also been a sense, I think, at many hospitals, is it still the case that you just let this go that it's all about the patient and you brush it off and you pivot to someone else and you know you're a bit of roadkill in this psychologically where, where are we or where should we be so thank you for that question i'll say that in in academic institutions at least we're incredibly privileged in that we are tasked with the creation of data and thought and guidance and leadership and so when i thought hard about this topic i thought is there a leader is there any um real research here? Is there anything that could point us to best practice so that we can operationalize that in hospitals? And, and several hospitals do have policies around this, ours included. Um, but interestingly, one of the probably the best known articles around this comes from Australia. And it was basically an observational but also longitudinal study looking at the white versus Aboriginal response around comments like this. And very interesting observations were made that can help all hospitals. I think the first one was, and it is the quote opening the article, was that common everyday racism has to be dealt with by common people, all of us, right? The second line in there, so that's the call for, for action and our responsibility. The other was that most people who make comments like this make these comments because they think they have societal support. So the reason to speak around this, although focus and content, is simply to transmit disapproval of the comment. You do not have support for this. So it's, it's almost ignoring the context, almost the content initially, but just signaling we don't, we don't really ascribe to these values. And then the third really interesting observation made in that research trial is that when these interactions went wrong, the observer who tried to interject was very triggered. So learning how to prevent that triggered response and approaching it from the perspective of helpful inquiry. For example, I believe I heard you say the following. It sounds not like something someone like you would say. Can you tell me more about that? Did I did I not hear you correctly? Sets you up for again a less triggered response, but yet signaling disapproval about the action. So, but you were talking particularly about the triggering of the witness as well, not just the person. So, how is it, how as as an institution does an institution change an entire culture and sort of maintain awareness of something like this where? You know, you, you don't think about it until you need it or, or, or inculcate its systemic change in a profession. So I'll ask my Five colleague, one? Dr. Pus Ogen, Dr. Yeah. Pus Ogen, who is really an expert in this and has, in fact, been my mentor around many uncomfortable conversations like this. And I will volunteer. She coached me through, through a similar situation, in that case, across gender barriers. But the reality of the situation is this is almost like sport. It doesn't get easier. I think you just become better prepared with time and training and exercise. So I don't think that the goal is for us to say, I feel absolutely comfortable with this subject, but rather to say, I am better prepared 
to handle the discomfort around this process. But Dr. Pusogan, what would you say about um, sort of what you've heard so far in terms of data or data free zones around this topic? So uh, thank you, Art, for for that question. Um, I want to confirm that we are not anomalies. Um, that this is a fairly universal experience. What what we have been talking about today, and that from our data, only about twenty percent of people actually who witness such an event actually step in and say anything. And the reasons that they hold back are their the primary reason they're worried that their response will make it worse. So knowing that they ha can have a response that will be uh, or has, has the best chance for being effective is really important. Um, they're not sure what to say. So actually having the, the, the phrases and the framework, it, like we do with many difficult conversations, is, a, is, is I think a very productive approach. They're concerned about their safety. And so that does need to be addressed in this whole training, uh, training issue. Um, and this is and this is really important. Many clinicians, I think, feel that somehow responding to something like this is somehow in conflict with another deep value of ours, which is to care for all patients, no matter what they say or do. Right? When I was trained, that was kind of how I was trained. You put your head down. You know, it's not about you. Just keep going. And so creating a response that 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 shows a clinician that they can respond in a way that is congruous with both of those values, with standing up for respect for everyone and treating patients in a compassionate fashion, showing that they can do both in addressing these issues is really important in terms of being able to overcome the barriers. Um, and I think, as Art, you said, um, it is essential that the platform be set, that it is the expectation of everyone who works at UBA that they will do something or say something when something like this happens. Um, and then no matter how that conversation goes, the other expectation is that they will debrief, uh, that they will talk with the team after something like this happens so that the scars hopefully don't don't ever show up and if, if they if they are scarred they're not so deep so so San, sanjay's situation was basically a hit and run which is different than these other ones and yes, I, yes. and and maybe that's why it was so unusual sanjay because it was a hit and run and i don't know that there's anything that you can do other than talk through it or are we missing something are there tips in that situation when it happens so quickly and it's gone and you're left holding this pile of you know what? Um, how do we, you know, uh, sure, uh, Tracy. Thanks. Um, yeah, these are, this is great conversation and I, I just want to tie some of the things that I'm, I've, I've heard to resonate. So one, I think Ziv, you, you said how when anti-Semitism comes, how you you handle it, and um, and I think there's two distinct things. I think there's how each of us individually handle it when we're the target is how we respond uh, when you know our who we are, um, and then there's how we need to respond when we are the supervisor of a trainee, a student, a staff member. Um, almost like being a parent. It's very different. So if if levity or um, or just letting it kind of um, roll off your back is how you handle, um, you know, bias or racism, then that's totally fine. Uh, there, but I think when it's someone else, you we have to kind of step into that role, just like we're a main character in a play, and you just need to be that person um, for for that in, in a protective way. And I think Ray really hit the nail on the head, which is um, we actually have gone through training with our underrepresented faculty um, using scripting, something called the professional IQ, which is um, is a Coursera course, and we've used it more in the case of the things that may happen in a in the context of say your co coworkers. So you're in a large faculty meeting. A female faculty member gives the, an answer. No one acknowledges it. The old senior male says it, and then everyone says, "Oh, that's a great idea. How about that one?" And so, we should definitely script, script it. So then, 
um, we are prepared for when it happens, uh, just like you do, you know, you uh, do plays before, you know, scrimmage before a real game. And then the last part I want to um, touch upon is how um, to keep yourself healthy. Um, and, um, and I think Kim brought this up, which is, um, for example, sometimes it's just not worth it. Um, right? It could just be you've got 15 minutes to get to your clinic and someone said something. But again, this is me personally. It's not me being responsible for someone. And I just need to say, you know what? Head down, get to my job, do this, and I'll regroup later. Now, I'll give an example where I decided not to do that. There's actually two times. Um, one was um, I'm in the a parking garage, and this happened to be the best parking garage. And in Wisconsin, that's one where you know you don't have to shovel your car out from snow uh, than you know because it's indoors. And I, you know, I was in scrubs. I didn't have my white coat. It's a Friday. I'm tired. I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to eat some pizza. I want to take it easy. And then I see the parking garage um, person, like his car is over there. And I get a sense that he is like figuring out, do I belong? He's like basically profiling me. And in this, I go, am I figure? is this happening or is this made up in my mind? And, um, and what happens is then I ask myself and I go, do I want to go home and have this stay and me to think and linger on this for the whole weekend? And I said, no, I don't want to waste my weekend. So what I did is I got out of my the driver's seat. I went to the back seat, got my white coat on. I put my white coat on. I sat in the driver's seat again. And then that person left. And to me, I said, yep, Tracy, you were being profiled in the story. It's not made up. It's not in my mind. Now I could just let go. It, it sucks. Right. You know, uh, and I was really upset about it, but I, but at least I didn't have that hang over my head because I was going to be doing mental gymnastics, if not consciously, subconsciously for the rest of that weekend. So I took that power back by pushing it, the envelope. And then I had that, you know, yep, the checkbox, that's what it was. Um, so that was one of my experiences, but I think the points that have been made are really, really important. I think the other point um, that I'd like the panel to talk about is, you know, cultural differences in how we were raised. If this conversation growing up as an Indian, uh, immigrant to America in 1971 would never happen at dinner at my house. In fact, it never happened ever. And now I have three young kids and I need to be a role model for them. And they, the reason I think this is really important is that our children are going to see this much differently than I do. And if I was to go home and talk to my father about this, it would be water off his back because he would often say the cream rises to the top. You need to put your head down and keep going. And, and that's been sort of my attitude when this happened is I went and did a procedure. And when I had 20 minutes, I, I thought about it more. Uh, and so I think we need to really recognize in our diverse biomedical workforce now, especially academic centers, that we may come with certain biases that we didn't know. And, and this has taken me about six weeks to figure this out. I came to this realization in the last few days. Um, so I think I share that with you. I don't know if Ray or others want to comment on that. Ray, you and I spoke about this in terms of what's the limit of empathy and how much do you need to tolerate and when is enough or too much? Yeah, I was going to, um, you know, thank uh, obviously Sanjay and Tracy for their comments. And Sanjay, I'll come back to yours, but I want to go address your questions, Eve, but also um, tag on to a word that Tracy used, and uh, that was levity. And so there's the reaction of the target around levity. But I, I want to bring up the point that oftentimes um, there's a question of intention 
from the aggressor, right? And so oftentimes there may be a question, oh, was he just making an off color joke? You know, was what was her attention? Was she just trying to make us feel comfortable? And Zeev, we talked about this story. I, hopefully I won't, um, you'll indulge me a little bit. As a third year med student with another Asian American woman um, on the wards, uh, first patient literally of my life, I'm with an intern and um, a Caucasian patient, uh, you know, asked where I'm from. And it's that classic, you know, where you're from. Right. Of course, I'm born in New York City, but, you know, where you're really from, right? And so uh, went through it, um, you know, from China. And then uh, he, he goes to um, the intern and uh, says, those Vietnamese people, they're so kind. They're so wonderful. And he turns to me and the uh, other Chinese woman goes, thank you. Welcome to this country. And, you know, it was well-intentioned, maybe. He wasn't trying to be a mean or macro macroaggression. But I guess you know we've talked about it. It's it's not the it's not my judge my job to adjudicate. It's not my job to determine what his or her attention really is. I think that there are things that are just wrong and need to be spoken up to. And yes, Sandra, you know, 20 years ago we would have never said that, but I think now is a different time, and it's it's really important to to say it. Um, understanding, I think someone else said that we're worried about making a scene. But sometimes you have to make a little bit of scene and it's not up to me to say, well, you know, this is just a patient, you know, he was in the Vietnam War, he, he has PTSD, I get that. But it, so, so Ray, let me, yeah. let me ask you and, and anyone else, very pragmatically, that situation, how do you respond in that moment? What are some sentences that you can bring right there that you can have in your pocket? Uh, so, first of all, I think it's, as we mentioned, it's hard for the target as the med student, you know, so many different levels as the minority and as the third year med student. So, I'll, I'll put myself in the shoes, what I would have wished my intern to say, right, and just say what I think other people have said, you know, sir, you know, I understand that maybe you're trying to be welcoming, but, you know, that's not the kind of language that we use here um, at MGH, right, that as a patient here, we are all respect each other and quite sure. frankly, that was that was a little offensive to me and I think to our medical students. And maybe that's a little tough, but I think that's one way to address it, be direct. Uh, other other options for people that they can have or anyone else? Of ways to speak to this? I mean, that that's a hard call. You're a med student and you're an intern, which means you're pretty low in that power structure. And Tracy, we were talking a couple of days ago about the aspect of power dynamics in this as well when you're a student alone or you're potentially with a supervisor. And, and I'll give you a small example. I have an uh, Asian American trainee who's Texan to the core with a big long star on his hat and a patient that he was first meeting said to him three times, are you a patriot? Now, I heard about this a couple of weeks later. It's clear what the intent was. He brushed it off. Um, I don't know that I would have been prepared as the witness to know what to do. So can we talk about both sides of that since that's been brought up? What did he do in that power dynamic and what would my role be as well? And how do I answer? Any of our panel. So I think one of the things that's important to, to, um, to talk about when we're uh, dealing with trainees or any hierarchy really, um, that is that they need to be able to turn somewhere for help, which is why at UVA, when we uh, started this training program, we really, we really tried to focus on those people to whom a trainee or another employee would turn for help, um, managers, attendings, uh, supervising residents, that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I think people need to know that they can turn to someone for help. Um, I think the basic framework that I think it was Art who um, said something about using a mixture of stating very clearly what the behavior was that was offensive or, con or concerning or disrespectful. And at the same time, being able to, to, to ask that curious question. So help me understand what were you intending or what, what did you, uh, is, there, is there a question I can answer or, um, that curiosity can sometimes get you something that's a little bit more transformative or more productive um, in a response. It all depends on the circumstance. If it's a drive by, you're not gonna do that. And, and sometimes humor or sometimes just debriefing. Um, if you wanna think about drive bys, oh my God, we, uh, we actually um, did some uh, video uh, scripting of, um, of scenarios that our valet parking 
folks uh, gave to us as what they dealt with every day. And these were literally drive by. I mean, literally from the car, someone, many people <laughs> hurl these, you know, these awful things and then they drive away. And one of the questions we had to ask ourselves is what can we do as an institution when that happens? Well, we have their license plate. We can actually send them a letter and say, you know what? You did this and we're not going to Valley Park your car anymore. So there are some consequences that we can actually think about as an institution. Um, we can transfer a patient. We can, uh, from the outpatient setting, we can fire them. All of those are, I think, um, kind of, uh, they, we need to know that we can do them. But if we can respond effectively in the moment and get the behavior change we need, then that's, that's where we want to spend our time. So we have a, we have some themes coming up from the chat, in which um, people have clearly experienced this and are commenting on the concern that they're not going to be supported, and that they're going to that that the offender is going to be supported, um, and the whistleblowers are going to be hurt, and that there really isn't an institutional culture to back you up, at any level. Kim, where do how 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 does this spread in a practical fashion? Maybe you're not at a place that has figured this out or is struggling to do it. I know we're brainstorming. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this, the difficulty here is you run into really these moral injuries, um, that, 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 um, are suffered because of this, um, this sense that, uh, I, I, I am going to be abused and no one's going to. Stand up for me to the institutions, not going to. Um, so that obviously leads to more challenges. Um, I think it's uh, very important to feel like your institution has your back. Um, and I think at UVA, we've really been trying to uh, get that uh, that point across. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's someone who could speak better to that. Um, I'm not in the administration, um, but I certainly can empathize with that concern. So, and we have a, we have a comment in the chat from Professor Salazar at MGH, who's actually talked about interprofessional training and simulations at MGH. So clearly institutions have been working on this, but we have a whole lot of hospitals and a whole lot of people. Um, and um, this may be a good time, Kim, uh, I think to talk about the begin framework, but Tracy, I think you wanted to get in with something there before, or should we turn to that? Yeah, thanks. If, um, I just wanted to, um, you know, acknowledge that I, I think as we're, um, you know, kind of going through, you know, I, I want to go back to Ray's part about experiencing that as a third year and things that I've learned um, from from uh, my friends who are of Asian American uh, background and how offensive uh, and and um, it is when people ask how, you know, where are you from? Um, and so what I've learned from them and there's a great video that's out there uh, that is it's perfect like if because many of our friends who are of asian descent or their culture and them as people are so respectful and kind that they will never just like in your face probably tell you how bad what you just did but that video in itself will probably save years of someone's life because it just allows you to let someone else probably do what you would like to do yourself but um but what i do instead is i just um i'll ask like where um you know where where do you consider your hometown? Um, and, and that opens up a lot of doors. Um, and, um, and then I, I would just, uh, you know, go, go back to the importance of us really supporting our, our learners. Um, and I think from the chat, someone brought up the fact of uh, that, you know, unless institutions, uh, yeah, this is um, from, I think, PJ, uh, that just says institutions should uphold the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion all in practice until those this happens. Those who want to be bystanders will succumb to the backlash. And I, I would say I, I agree. And one way you can do this is I think um, just like uh, pay, their patients have a bill of rights is that we need to incorporate 
as soon as you enter into this space, we all we all raise who we are as people, right? We have professionalism, conduct, and code of ethics, and we want our patients to also um, uh, behave in a certain way. And so that's the prevention aspect. You know, you're not going to pick someone based on your preference um, that would be stereotyping or derogatory. That's not what we do here. And if you feel that's important in your care pathway, then there's another institution right around the block where we'd be happy to refer you to. Um, so that that makes sure we don't undervalue our key people. Um, because once you do that, uh, you start to lose people, they burn out and they want to leave institutions. So I'd like to add a comment here. Um, I see Bush Bell on, on this group today. Um, and I, I've learned a lot from him and his team. They um, have taught us, I think, what is a very effective sentence. And that is, if I understood you correctly, insert the comment, this is just not consistent with our values. So it is not my belief or your belief, it is the institutional value that this is not acceptable. And, and I think the word institutional value carries a lot of weight because the, the, the receiver understands that this is not a one-off. This is a cultural front around the, the content of the content. And you need the support on things that may that that you don't have to run the tape in your head, which is this is too micro to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you feel it, then it's there, and you're going to be backed up. Um, Kim, you had shared the the acronym begin, and perhaps you give us some of that uh, sort of as a structure to use to have in our absolutely. Process. So what we've been coming around to, and many people have volunteered their strategies for, you know, exactly. What can I say? How can I step in? And and more of this is elaborated quite well in the stepping in for respect program that that Peggy spoke about. And the begin acronym, it's uh, basically taking a breath, so breathing, which helps you calm, focus, assess your goals, maybe suspend judgment, just sort of be present with what just happened. Again, if you have that opportunity. And demonstrate some empathy. So um, that might be, you know, to a patient saying, I, I'm sure this must be hard being so sick or, or being uh, unsure what's happening with your health. Um, then really setting your setting goals for what you value, for what, you what value. you're trying to do, what we just spoke about, what the University of Virginia stands for, and what we you know, how we all approach uh, the treatment and respect uh, for everyone. And then inquiring, um, as someone uh, already said, you know, asking them, help me understand what you meant by that. Um, and then really negotiating to this common goal, given what's just occurred, how can we, how can we move forward with taking care of the, you know, whatever the needs are you came into the hospital for. So, so you have again, to be confident that the institution has your back when you say that. And and how do you get that? At, you're at a community hospital of 100 people, and in our chat, we're sensing that people don't have that confidence, that they're there. So, Dr. Haskell, I'd like to make a comment. I think sometimes what we can do as leaders in the institution is to think about our spaces and how the space signals an institutional policy. For instance, it is incredibly reassurance that in the lobby of, a, of an institution, we portray diversity, um, you know, people of all sizes and ages and sex and orientations and thinkings and partnerships. And that space can be your support in making a comment. I, was, I had a similar situation with actually an Asian medical student, and I wasn't sure exactly how to, how to respond. And to the comment of culture, um, I, I like to speak. Hispanic culture is all about let's let's talk about it, right? And and I remember someone telling me, think about what your basic competency is as a doctor. What is your competency, regardless of specialty? Your competency is to care for people, just to care for people, mm -hmm. whether that person is a patient or whether that patient is your colleague 
or whether that person is someone you don't like very much at all. If that's really your competency, right? That's, that's I think, where you get your courage. But I would say um, really being active with your hospital at designing the space to be your support when no one else is around can be also very um, helpful to all of us. So Kim, I wanted to come back to you so you could continue to build on that. So you described this format and I find that very comforting because scripting those aspects and saying, first, I hear you and the institution has my back. Um, it's hard to be sick. And how do we work toward mutual respect? And I know that I've, I've, I've squeezed it tighter than it is. Um, but, but just as another way to bring it forward, but sometimes you're faced with people who are just angry and aggressive and it's hard to work with. And maybe the scenario is these are longstanding patients and there's a family member that's there, or maybe it's an acute care situation in an ED or on a ward where, you know, it's a, it's a different situation and this isn't going to engage somebody. You try it, you know, how are we going to deal with that? What can we tell people or other well, scenarios? Again, I think you, you still have to have your goal of what is absolutely not tolerated and, and uh, trying to work towards that goal um, by um, saying, you know, this behavior is not acceptable. And if it continues, we will have to find another way to get your needs met. But this, this behavior is just not going to be tolerated. Um, and, and Peggy may have additional um, strategies that you, you want to share. I'm not sure, um, Peggy, if you want to add something. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important to know what the policy is at your institution and how it can be utilized. That being said, even if you have a strong policy, remember, if the end result is I'm going to need to transfer this inpatient who's in the MICU, that's going to be a tough transfer, right? If they're an outpatient, there are all kinds of limits that we can set and all kinds of consequences that we can create. Our Bill of Rights for patients also includes the expectation for respect for all of our all of our team members. So that's the policy. That's our backdrop. We know that we can use that if we need to, but the sometimes uh, the practicality of that gets very difficult. Um, I would say that it's been, um, in my experience, it's been fairly rare as long as there's time that um, with this approach we we haven't been able to. Uh, get the kind of behavior change with, that we need, unless the patient, and we haven't even talked about that, if the patient is demented um, or otherwise seriously ill and not in control of their behavior, that's a, you know, that's a whole different story and you have to have concerned that before. Even so, those can be very hurtful situations and that's one of the times when you need to work with the staff to figure out how are we going to, how are we going to tag team this, how are we going to, um, at least relieve the, the staff from the intensity of that really damaging experience if it cannot be controlled because of dementia, for example, um, uh, or psychosis or, you know, all kinds of reasons why. Um, so I think having the backdrop, making sure that uh, everyone in the institution actually gets trained and knows that what the expectation is. So that if, if one of us doesn't succeed, the other one comes in and, and, and helps. I mean, maybe you do need the authority figure coming in to this patient and saying, you know what? What she said, it's absolutely true. So let's, let's you know, figure out how we're gonna go from here. So it takes the authority figure. Here. So Tracy, as a, as, a, as a diversity and engagement leader, and I'm sorry if I butchered that, when you're thinking top down as an institution and an area you worked in and, and you're thinking of how to signal this all the way down or a starting point for programs where people are listening and say, I want to, I want to bring this up in my institution. I'm in a 200 bed hospital in the middle of X. How, how does this dialogue begin when you're just lower in the middle of the food chain? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I mean, you know, I, I think one is uh, what we've really learned, I think, from the student experience, uh, and I'll speak more to what I know better, the med school student experience, is we have uh, anonymous reporting uh, systems, so uh, student mistreatment. So we want to hear you, and we want to know 
what is the true denominator of how often is this occurring so we can really kind of um, strategize and and know how big of a problem it is and to address it so it's really important to close that loop really important because um, us having banners and new hires and all this you know fanfare for diversity equity and inclusion if we don't live up to it at its foundation we look foolish uh and we look non you know we look disingenuous we uh at all levels at, and even the highest level really um and so we we have to walk the walk and uh, that we that we're talking and really be honest and going back to you know, like you said, uh, I think arts, uh, you know, our common denier is to care for each other, to care for the patient, you know, to care for each other and, and, uh, and to really find, remember, you know, what is this all about? And that is part of caring is not to let our people get, get hurt. Um, when we talked about those really hard scenarios that, that, uh, that, uh, uh Peggy and Kim brought up about um, a, di a disruptive patient, I think safety really resonates with me, is we have to make sure it's safe for um, both parties. And so I'll speak to the provider part and give an experience where one of my colleagues at an offsite clinic, uh, maybe about 30, 40 minutes outside of our, our, um, our Charlottesville equivalent in Madison, um, She's of Indian uh, uh, in descent. A uh, person comes in, is very abusive, doesn't want her as uh, the um, uh, physician, and she visibly comes out of that room shaken. Um, and so um, we have to support her. So she reports that it gets up the food chain to the highest level. And now we want to really figure out do you want to finish out clinic today or do we want to like block some clinic or do we want to just call it a day and and just not business as usual not business because what was usual about what that person experienced and uh, and then once we recover make sure that person's safe then we start to kind of you know do more i think strategic planning and interventions and prevention models but we really have to live live out the the credo if we say it then we really need to be it. So, yes, Sanjay, I was going to call on you for a couple of reasons, including share, if anything, what's come out of this and what you're doing or what the dialogue has been as you brought it up and down at the mail. So, um, this is excellent conversation. Thank you, Dr. Downs, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Um, I think I think there's a couple things. When this happened, I sent our CEO an email who I know and he immediately uh, pointed me to the head of HR, who's an Asian American woman. And, and they started a process uh, to understand what happened. Since it was a hit and run, there weren't a lot of details. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I would say, even at our institution, there are classes, but most leaders uh, and physicians don't know they exist. And so when you're in leadership, I would submit to you, how about a conversation at your faculty meeting about this? Because what you really need is buy-in, not just from those of us that are on this panel, but from those of us that are bystanders or, or colleagues to see the hurt and, and what this does, uh, and especially the burnout. I will tell you, uh, for a couple of days, I thought about going back to India to do procedures. Now, um, you know, I've been in America since seven, so uh, it did really shake my foundation of of what, who I am and and why I'm, you know, doing all this in Rochester, Minnesota. And and the last point I'll make is a point around uh, why physicians don't want to go into small hospitals, especially minorities and others. These are the scenarios that scare people from going to places that they're not gonna get supported. So if I'm a large academic center, I've got 50 hospitals, I'm trying to get everybody there and support them. I think it's really important that this conversation happen because what you're gonna see is turnover. And if your colleagues are not like the colleagues on this call, it's really going to be hard for you to come home and say, you know, honey, this is great. 
that stay here for another 20 years. And so those are some things that I, I sort of want to bring up uh, just for the leaders and, and, and my colleagues. Dr. Mister, I really enjoyed your comments. Thank you. I think that um, implicit in what you said is that we, we have a lot of work to do. And sometimes we try to find excuses for a, a comment like, oh, well, he's just older. He's from an older generation or things like that. I think we have to restructure that that conversation around, you know, culture and, you know, time and rank probably doesn't, you know, shouldn't affect what we expect of people at work. But I'll say an uplifting note and a very uplifting note that as someone mentioned before, the world is changing. And particularly the younger generations want to change the world. Um, the case that I was involved with that I interviewed before was was a, a an Asian American student um, who had a very similar interaction as Dr. Lu had. She was being questioned where she where her you know where she was from. She said Virginia. I mean your parents. Where are your parents from? And she said Virginia. Well, how about your grandparents? She, she stopped for a second in her young, but incredibly mature age, looked at the patient and said, where is your grandmother from? Right? And I mean, I just felt so, so proud, right? And, and I was, I was a little immobilized to the initial response, not because I'm a minority, actually, but because my nephews are Asian. Right? And so you're taken to a place where you realize we, we are a diverse group of people and you just never know who's around, right? But to watch sort of new generations in our world change in the way they approach this is, should be noted that, that there is forward movement and we are, um, we should be hopeful that there will be more with conversations like this. Arturo, thank you for an uplifting perspective. I wanna be um, uh, aware of time and I want to have, I want to start to move into a summary phase for all the panelists to give you just a couple of minutes to uh, emphasize the points that you've either made or you want people to leave with. I want to be sure that everybody is aware that uh, we will have resources specifically highlighting the begin framework, which is a really structured, easy to use um, uh, thing to have sort of, I've got it on my phone as soon as Kim shared it, pasted in um, on our website as well. We're gonna have links to the step up program in which you can actually enroll and see examples of this type of scripting, these kinds of scenarios that in our chat people have shared that they're also seeing at their own institutions as well. So those resources will be there. And I also wanted to share an email, which is UVA keynote one at Gmail. If you have comments as attendees or you'd like to hear more or continue this dialogue or other things you'd like to put on, that's UVA keynote one at gmail.com. So if we can go into that summary phase, please, Artur, you're next to me on the grid, so you're up. <laughs> I would say, um, remember your source of courage and your competency, which is to care for people. Be involved with your hospital, not just around understanding the policy, but participating in the design of space. Because space can be your courage and your sense of strength when you are alone. And third, my, my favorite line is, this comment is simply not consistent with our institutional values. That's the line I take home. Excellent. Sanjay. Uh, I think um, the concept of awareness and, and having the strength to have this conversation with your colleagues when it happens. I think many of us on this call have had stuff like this happen and our colleagues will never find out. So I think just sharing, letting your guard down, sharing that this happened and letting them hear what happened. That, that's, I think, very important. And I'll give you an example. I spoke to half a dozen people in my institution about things like this, and they all had something like this happen, and they were very uh, uh, not, they never discussed it. So they took it inside, they kept it inside, and never brought it out. So I think we as physicians do this, and for our own resilience and our own, so, uh, you know, brains and the way we think, we should just go somewhere, staff meeting, and say, "Hey, this happened. I just want to share it." And, and Sanjay, you sharing this with me is why we have this evening. So thank you, um, Tracy. 
Yeah, I I just want to. Um, this is a great panel, and so first, thanks if for including me, and um, you know, very excited about um, joining, you know, UVA, and then just this you know stellar group of people who are committed, um, you know, to to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I I think the part that resonates with me is is twofold. One is. Um, uh, the the quote that Peggy said that twenty percent of people who witness an event will will respond back only twenty percent. So um, so let's move that number up. Um, and I think the way to do that is that we get trained, right? We 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 are training, you know, experts, right? That's what we do. We train people, and we've been trained. And then once we've been trained, we do it again. And that's just you know we're geared to do that. So let's get that number up. And then another number that. Um, uh, you know, sticks to me is when you look at the graduating questionnaire, at least across medical students, there is only about 30% of our graduating MDs who feel comfortable um, interacting across different um, ethnic cultural backgrounds. It's a really low number. Um, and we need to do a better job um, through helping our own trainees and future, you know, leaders to to uh, be able to lead these discussions, not only amongst themselves. And then let's not also forget that uh, while we're focusing on the patient being the initi initiator, that oftentimes the real initiators are those who we work with uh, every day. Um, and so these skills that we're going to learn are going to equip us in multiple um, uh, environments. Ray. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, you know, this year has been marked by loss and I would say there's sort of a loss of idealism, right? And a loss of you, you see all this, these things happening and uh, there's sort of this ugly truth underneath this, the surface, but um, I want to take a page from art and sort of think about the pathway to hope. And, uh, you know, just like art mentioned, you know, uh, as med student, I have teenagers like many of you and, and honestly, the, the Gen Z, um, generation is amazing. Right. And, and my, my teenager daughter and her teenage friends are fired up about this. Like I hear them talking about how this is unacceptable, uh, what they would do in the subway, um, starting podcasts about, you know, uh, Asian American issues and, and they're just not going to take it. So I guess what I would say is we should get fired up on behalf of them. And it sounds sort of Whitney Houston esque, but I mean, the best the more we can support that generation, the less this will happen. Excellent. Kim, please. I, I completely agree. I love, I love what you said. Thank you. And I, I think, yes, understanding that we need to approach it. We need to communicate. We need to share and be open with each other and model um, and, and, and learn from the younger people as well and, and just be open to that. But really this idea of, of doing things like we're doing tonight, talking about it, putting it out in the open and, and sharing strategies that are effective, that are gonna be respectful and honor our core values, which is to care for people. Um, so I wanna say thank you, Dr. Haskell, for, for, for tonight. I think this has been really helpful and, and hopefully it's just the beginning of many ongoing conversations and work that we do. Kim, thank you so much. And I want to put a plug in for your opening keynote on burnout as well, which I have gone back to um, in, in recording as well. Excellent. Um, Peggy, you've, you've had the program across multiple institutions and have put almost a thousand students through this. So what would you like to leave us with? Well, first of all, I am really inspired and so happy this, this conversation happened. So thank you Z, for putting it together. Thank you everyone for for stepping in uh, to talk about this stuff. Um, and yes, thank you. I, I would like to um, invite anyone and everyone um, who's on this call or anyone you know to um, participate in a Stepping In for Respect workshop. If you're from within UVA, you can just email Jan Balmer or Pamela Lace at the CME office and they will schedule it. If you're with that, not, not within UVA, we have started a collaborative of institutions that are um, using this framework and then researching it. So we're collecting data as we go along to make sure that we're making a difference. 
and although it's heartbreaking to hear these stories, we always start with the workshop with stories of how people have experienced this in their own lives in their workplace. It's heartbreaking to hear those stories, but it's also really heartening to hear the stories of people stepping in and having a productive and even transformative uh, uh, encounter um, and getting the behavior change they need and actually coming away from that feeling in, engaged and empowered. That's really heartening. So that's what um, that's what I, I hope for um, every day. And and uh, and so I welcome, welcome any of you to 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 be a part of that because uh, it would be really wonderful. Thank you so much, Peggy, for doing this Vanguard work and spreading it. And we'll have those resources available on the keynote website. Um, this has been an extraordinary evening. And I'm very grateful for all of you for taking the time to come together and for all the attendees and for so many people who've asked as the first point, is it recorded so I can watch it? When I'm actually free, and it'll be available very quickly with the resources. We've talked about tools, about safe spaces, about kind of resources that you can create or seek, about how to engage your colleagues and raise the culture so that you have a group that'll support you, and um, a way to think about this in civilities and how to be less uh, otherism, as Dr. Newsom wrote into the chat as well. And perhaps we can move ahead together. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us in the keynote. And I wish you all well. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.